goal here is to get everyone together, to get everyone to meet and, and uh, start communicating, and maybe we can find ways to surface uh, challenges we have uh, from the private sector side. And uh, one of the big uh, uh, pushes that AmCham, the American Chamber, is doing this, uh, this year is trying to focus a lot more on advocacy, engaging uh, from the private sector to the world government of Cambodia to, to bring up issues or challenges that we think we have in the business sector, in this case specifically for ICT issues, uh, with the goal being to improve uh, all of our businesses, to improve Cambodia's competition, our competitiveness in the world, uh, and, and basically to make sure that Cambodia, as ASEAN is growing tremendously, that Cambodia can share in that growth and be a hub of technology uh, and innovation. Um, so my name is Chris McCarthy. I've been the chair of the ICT committee for the past five years. We've done quite a lot of uh, meetings, quite a lot of engagement with the government. Uh, we've put on 16 different demo days. Uh, most of them are at Rain Tree, thanks to Zoe. Um, and uh, we're looking to start those back up again uh, now that uh, things have started to open up a little bit. Uh, we, will be, we will resume next month our regular ICT meetings. Uh, and next month we are actually planning to organize and hold elections for uh, a chair and a vice chair for the committee. Uh, so I'll send out all that information online. Uh, so we really want to encourage everyone to participate. Uh, it's your Chamber of Commerce, it's your American Chamber, and, and tell us what we can do for you and how we can help you. We'd love your participation. So thanks for, thanks for coming. So today I wanted to attend basically to get a couple of messages across. One, uh, one of the mandates the board has agreed on is digitalization. So this year we want to digitalize AmpChamp more. Uh, we understand uh, it's important to have uh, video content uh, and important content in terms of what members need to know. So you may have seen that we've launched the AmpChamp channel and there's been a few videos um, on, I would call it on the educational side, we did on transfer pricing we did a video on how to handle audits. So we're getting experts in. We had KM10 from Baker Tilly do the uh, audit one, and we had uh, VDB Loy uh, uh, do the uh, transfer pricing one. So digitalization in terms of providing educational information to our members for free. So it's a public service. We see it as a public service that you're getting this information and you can digest it. Hopefully it's useful to you and you can use it for uh, your business to help you in your business. The other is we're trying to showcase members. Showcase means that we want to let members tell the market through the AmpChamp channel about their products and their services and about their company. We'll also be giving you updates through the advocacy committee uh, on what we're doing. This is an advocacy committee, so uh, we will be, as Chris said, uh, every committee will have its own chair and vice chair and we'll be publishing minutes on what the issues the advocacy committees are addressing, and that will be public information. And finally, events. We, we want to use the AmpCham channel to do events. The last thing I'd like to say is we, this is a very important committee. So that's it, so enjoy the talk by Jay. Thank you for the opportunity for me to just give you an update on what's happening with AmpCham. And thank you for being our members, our customers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me here today. I'm gonna to give a quick talk on uh, the e-commerce framework here in Cambodia, and then also an update on uh, digital regulations. Mm -hmm. So I think in Cambodia, when you talk about like, the ICT framework, really the foundation is like the e-commerce law and some of those e-commerce regulations. And then, as, as I said, for the digital policy, uh, there was a new digital policy enacted in 2021. And I think that actually contains a lot of like interesting uh, items that are like, very relevant to like, committee members. So we're going to end our talk on, on, on that. Uh, so a little bit of the agenda, we're going to talk about the regulatory framework, which really is the e-commerce law, and we'll sort of go through some of those regulations and see where we are. Uh, we'll talk about some of the tax obligations and talk about where we are today, because a number of regulations have come out, and then we'll get into that, that national digital policy. So for the e-commerce regulations, uh, that's really been, I think, something of, of great interest to a lot of people because it potentially requires people to get new licenses and permits. Now, uh, the foundation is the law on e-commerce, and that came out in 2019, 2020. So if the question is, why are we still talking about it today, several years later, it's because since it was enacted, a lot of like implementing regulations have come out. 
Uh, so slowly we're moving towards the point where companies might actually have to get this license. So if you sort of look at the history, uh, and that's what we have here, the law came out in 2020, then you had some sub-decrees in 2020. Uh, those set out the basic framework of what licenses you can get under the e-commerce law. And then that PROCUS 290 gave more details generally on what documents you'd have to submit in order to get the licenses. Now, starting in 2020, lots of people were asking, can I apply for my e-commerce license? Can I apply, can I apply, can I apply? But there was something really important missing. And there was one major reason why nobody could apply for their e-commerce license. And that was because there was no application available. So when you would actually go to the ministry and ask for some of these application forms to apply for the license, it didn't exist. So actually, only in May 2021 did an application even become available. So starting in May, at least there was an application where you could apply if you wanted to. So then the question, of course, becomes, are people applying for this e-commerce license? And the answer is, although the application became available in May 2021, so you could apply, uh, there's been a number of delays. So most recently, in March 2022, uh, the government issued another notification saying that they're going to delay the enforcement of penalties until July 1st, 2022. So I'll simply say there's been like a number of delays uh, starting in, in 2020 to 2021 to 2022. So penalties have been delayed until then. So I would say because of this postponement, uh, really July will be, will be the time that will be very important for people to see. Is the government enforcing penalties? Are they forcing people to take action? I'll just say if you're a company and you haven't looked at getting your e-commerce license, now would be a good time to look at you know, what requirements are, are required, what supporting documents are necessary, and at least be ready uh, because you know, I think the requirement will start to be imposed probably from July unless there's another postponement. Now, in addition, uh, when you think about, like, I think, the framework for e-commerce, uh, there's really two sides. You have the regulatory one, which is about the e-commerce law and e-commerce licenses. And that's really focused on the domestic audience here in Cambodia. But then on the other side, you also have a number of like, tax regulations, which is a little bit more focused on people like offshore. So also, if you're a company here, uh, perhaps you have like an offshore subsidiary or offshore parent company. They're doing certain business in Cambodia. This might be more applicable to them. So when you look at the tax regulations, there there's been like a number of developments, a little bit more recently in 2021, that are really relevant to, I think, the e-commerce business landscape generally. The first one really came out, uh, the progress on income tax in January 2001. And that was a general income tax regulation. And I think they made a really interesting change, which is potentially relevant to a lot of offshore businesses. In that regulation, they changed the definition of what is a permanent establishment. And that concept, permanent establishment, it means if you do certain activities in Cambodia, you are supposed to incorporate a company and pay tax. So in January 2021, they changed the definition of a permanent establishment to include doing e-commerce. So potentially, you could have foreign companies doing e-commerce activities in Cambodia that could potentially be captured by this definition of a permanent establishment. If they're captured, then they should incorporate an entity and pay tax. The next thing that came out then was sub decree number 65 in April 2021. So that document actually, or that practice, took a different approach. And that said, if you were an offshore uh, e commerce business, you would actually have to register uh, and then either pay, collect, and pay VAT in Cambodia. So this actually had a different requirement. It acknowledged that you could be an offshore uh, e commerce business. It acknowledges that you don't have to set up a company, but you still have to register for VAT and pay VAT. Uh, then subsequently in September 2021 and December 2021, they had some more implementing regulations uh, surrounding that, that new regulation. Now, of course, the issue becomes, when do I have to comply with these new regulations? If you sort of looked at those regulations, you would have thought you had to comply back in 2021. But there's been a number of delays as well uh, for the enforcement of this regulation. So under the most recent one, this notification 776, which came out in January of 2022, the obligation uh, to register and to collect VAT was postponed until April 1st, 2022. So today is March 16th, I, I believe. So actually that deadline is coming up pretty quickly. So I think for a lot of businesses, also offshore businesses, uh, 
there was a feeling that they you know, didn't need to comply. They wanted to sort of see how things were going. But now you are seeing uh, this deadline come up because there's been a postponement and a new deadline. So I think people are sort of watching, and probably a lot of offshore businesses will look at that very closely and decide if they want to comply. Uh, as for the scope of the e-commerce law, so that's like sort of the basic regulatory framework. Now we'll just talk a little bit about like the scope of the e-commerce law and, and who it applies to. The law is very broad. So it basically talks about you know, managing e-commerce between Cambodia and other countries. So potentially it has a really broad scope that could capture offshore companies as well as like onshore companies. Although when we talk about the licenses that you can actually apply for, we'll see that it really targets onshore companies. Uh, under the e-commerce law, there's two large groups of uh, businesses that are, that are regulated. You have intermediaries and e-commerce service providers. Intermediaries tend to be more like uh, the telecom service provider, network service provider, internet service providers. It does talk about like online payment services and online marketing, but it tends to be a little bit more like the service providers in the telecom space. And then for the e-commerce service providers, those would be people selling goods and services, except insurance. So that's one of the exceptions. And that talks about uh, you know, what you might traditionally think of as like your e-commerce businesses, websites where you're selling goods and services, uh, online marketplaces, auctions. Uh, so that's like a, a broader subset of, of businesses. So these are all the people, uh, the intermediaries and the e-commerce service providers that would have an obligation to get a license under the e-commerce law. Uh, as for the licensing requirements, uh, that's generally put into some of those practices that I referenced earlier. Uh, and just to be sort of clear, uh, those practices sell a lot and they talk a lot about certificates, licenses, authorizations. So we have just sort of a, a, sort of a simple slide that just kind of breaks down what's required for different kinds of businesses. So if you're a company or a branch here in Cambodia, it's relatively simple. You need an online service provider certificate from the MPTC, from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. And then step two is you need an e-commerce license from the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, that's like the basic, the basic requirements. Uh, in terms of the validity of those, uh, it's three years for the uh, e-commerce e license. There's a three-year validity period. You're supposed to be able to apply and get that in about 10 days. Uh, but delays certainly could be common. Now, if you're a natural person in a sole proprietorship, uh, I'm not sure if that's really the target audience here, but there might be some people that fall into that category. If it does, then uh, you require something called an e-commerce authorization. So you just, have, you just need the e-commerce authorization. You don't also need the certificate from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication. So a little bit of a simpler procedure for uh, natural persons and sole proprietorships. Uh, we should also note, if you do fall into that natural person sole proprietorship category, there are some exemptions. So if your business is less than falls below a threshold of $62,500 a year, which I know is also sort of an important metric for like in the tax world for what's like a, what requires you to pay tax or not. Uh, if, you, if you fall under that, then you're exempt. Also, for certain kinds of like services, uh, they're also exempt. So if you're doing private tutorial services, then you're also exempt from getting these certificates. Uh, also though, if you are exempt, you still, there is still a notification uh, requirement at the Ministry of Commerce. So even if you fall in this exempt category, you still need to notify the Ministry of Commerce. So they seem to be very active in trying to get a list of like everybody that's doing you know, online business, whether you actually need the certificates or not. Uh, now we'll touch on what are the tax obligations. So when you look at like, uh, the tax obligations, the, the new one that we're going to focus on is that sub-decree number 65, which came out last year. So again, anybody supplying goods and services into Cambodia through e-commerce is captured. So that could really be a really a wider range of businesses. You think about the Facebooks of the world, the Amazons of the world, uh, all kinds of businesses that would be providing their, their goods and services into Cambodia could be captured. Although uh, it does also have a certain threshold, that $62,500 threshold. So if you're an online business and your business is less than that, then you're not captured by the regulation. But if you're $62,500 or more, then you are captured. So it does seem to be going after sort of like the larger, more visible e-commerce companies, as opposed to any small, teeny website that maybe has a very small number of sales into Cambodia. Uh, under the tax regulations, they give a lot more of a comprehensive list of what activities are e-commerce and what activities are covered. So I'm not going to read off the list, but I'll just sort of like leave it up there. So I'll just say the tax regulations just have a lot more detail about what 
who's potentially covered. And again, that's a pretty, that's a pretty comprehensive like, list of services. Lots of, I think, people, if they interact with like, offshore suppliers, uh, could, could, you know, they're, 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 that offshore business could be listed here. Especially if you're doing things with like data, data storage, servers abroad, uh, then, then it could often be captured by these sorts of regulate, by this, by this tax regulation. Uh, in terms of like what is the requirement uh, for the taxation of non-residents, there's really two things. Uh, it depends if you're doing a business to consumer transaction or a business to business transaction. So if you're an offshore business and you're dealing with like a non-VAT registered person in Cambodia, that could be an individual, or that could be a small business that just isn't VAT registered. Then the offshore business has to declare and pay VAT by the 20th of the following month. So again, if an offshore business is, in, is uh, contracting selling goods and services to, to individuals, then the offshore business has to collect the VAT and then pay it. However, if it's a B2B transaction, if the offshore company is contracting with a VAT registered person in Cambodia, probably like many of the businesses that we have, a VAT registered business in Cambodia, then in that case, they have a, a reverse charge system, which actually means that the domestic VAT registered company in Cambodia has to withhold the VAT and pay that to the government. So I think that's actually something quite interesting for all of us, because I think probably many of our businesses contract in certain ways for goods and services with offshore service providers. So again, this is something that we'll have to do. Um, what are the other things I want to talk about uh, for the, the taxation of non-residents. And I'll just sort of mention this because I mentioned it before. It did say uh, in the practice on income tax, it did have this uh, definition of permanent establishment. That's something I mentioned before. So in that case, uh, again, if you're an offshore business, you could have a permanent establishment by doing e-commerce in Cambodia. And that potentially could lead to certain tax obligations and the obligation to set up a business. I will say there's a little bit of uh, inconsistency between that subdecree number 65 and the practice on income tax. I just want to highlight that. Uh, if you are an offshore business, then uh, I think you need to be a little bit aware of that inconsistency. But I think if you follow Subdecree 65 and you register uh, to collect and pay VAT, then I think you know, you're clearly complying with your main obligations. I think time will tell whether the General Department of Taxation tries to go after offshore service providers on the basis that they now have a permanent establishment here in Cambodia. So those are the main uh, e-commerce obligations and a little bit of an update where we are today. Now I'm just going to briefly talk about the national digital policy, which I think is actually something really interesting uh, for our members, particularly if we're looking at what kind of advocacy can we do uh, in the future. Because I think this national digital policy really has a roadmap of what the Cambodian government wants to do. And I think a lot of industries can look at that roadmap and see what regulations are relevant to them. So for the new... Uh, for this new policy, uh, it's called the Cambodia Digital Economy and Society Policy Framework. It was issued in 2021. Uh, it, it's quite substantial, and a lot of time and effort and care was clearly put into it. It's about 180 pages long, so there's a lot in there. Uh, the goal is, as it talks about here, is to really you know, help uh, develop a very vibrant uh, digital economy in Cambodia. And then in doing so, really focusing on three areas, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the state, the government, uh, focusing on the government's digital capabilities and how they provide uh, public services. Also, citizens building up their uh, capacity and skills so that Cambodia can have a vibrant digital economy. And then also for business as well. And business is really broad. I mean, it goes, gets into fintech businesses, banking and finance, and certainly all the other kinds of businesses that exist as well. So it really has a very broad focus that I think is of interest to, again, the government, just building up capacity to citizens generally, but then also for the business community as well. Uh, the policy framework, uh, I will say, it contains 44 specific policy measures to develop digital infrastructure and to build trust uh, in these like, in digital infrastructure and like online digital policies. And then it also contains 82 specific policy measures to strengthen these three areas, uh, skills of citizens, uh, digital government and public services, and also enabling digital businesses. And these specific uh, policy measures are set out in Annex 1 uh, of this policy. So I'd really encourage people to take a look at that Annex 1. Uh, it's very comprehensive, and it will list like these like, policy measures. It will list the committee that's responsible for that policy measure, 
and at the same time, it will also list the ministry that has oversight over that area. So I think for, for our uh, committee, if we're looking at you know, what is of interest to the Cambodian government, what uh, ministries are handling these areas, this annex provides an excellent roadmap. Also, I'd say to any businesses, if you're worried about what kind of regulations are, 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 in, are coming uh, down the line, what is the Cambodian government looking at doing, I think you can see that roadmap pretty clearly now, and you can really look at it, and then I think it opens up good avenues for advocacy, because then we see what committee is in charge of it. So just to take uh, one little step back, because I've already been talking about the committees, uh, one of the things about this like, framework, it does establish a national digital uh, economy and council. So this, this council, its goal is to advise on the implementation to ministries, institutions, and as I highlighted, the private sector. So to me, when I hear that it's supposed to also advise on the private sector, it does suggest already that there should be some opportunities to liaise with that the council uh, to provide some sort of like comments or feedback to them. Uh, in terms of the council, they also create three committees. And again, they're sort of like based around these three pillars of uh, the government, uh, the economy and business, uh, so the government, business, and then a security committee, which I think would deal with things like the cybercrime law as well. So there's three committees uh, that are also like tasked with, uh, with, with assisting the, uh, the council. Yeah, that, that sort of brings me to the end of the presentation. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Uh, again, I think one of the takeaways from the digital policy is that there is a roadmap from the Cambodian government. It's a very specific roadmap that has a lot of like policy initiatives. We can see the ministry, we can see the committee involved. So I think from an advocacy standpoint, it really opens up a lot of opportunities for our members to, uh, to positively try to influence the Cambodian government and their policies. Thank you. Um, so we have time for, if there's a couple of questions, I think we, we can ask sure, those. Sure, can you, can you clarify if the offshore company registers for offshore VAT that that negates the payment of withholding tax on those imported services or goods? So we've been explaining this way. If, uh, if the offshore ent entity is VAT registered, they eventually will become VAT registered and they issue invoice to you, then withholding tax will not be applicable to such payment. So it's either withholding tax if they are non-resident and don't have VAT number, or it's a VAT tax because they will be VAT registered and they have VAT number and they can issue VAT invoice to you. So one of it. So I think now that the Cambodian government actually does have a pretty clear mechanism for registering for VAT and collecting it, I, I think a lot of the companies will comply, actually. And I think people have already asked about it. So I think once like, the Cambodian government expresses and shows its commitment to, to registering companies and getting them to, to collect and pay VAT, I, I, I tend to think more companies will do it, especially the really high, uh, high visibility companies, because I think they would be the ones that everyone would be looking to to see if, if they comply. Yeah, I think in a very general sense, uh, there are like uh, schemes in other countries that are, that are looking at the same sort of issue and trying to determine how they can like tax like offshore companies selling goods and services into them. So I think in that sense, like the Cambodian government is like consistent with like, you know, taxation trends like around the world. You know, all I can say, this is based on like a, a public news report. So I, I have no other insights into it, but I know there was an article in the Khmer Times that said that Facebook had actually registered with the General Department of Taxation uh, under this like sub decree number 65. So again, I, I'm only basing that on what I read in the newspaper, but to me that seems like a real indication that, you know, like large companies that have significant amounts of business and again, there is a threshold of 62,500. So again, if you're a small business and you occasionally have some sales into Cambodia, you're not gonna be captured by this regulation. But if you're a really substantial business and 62,500 is not so small for an online business, you, know, you already have like a substantial amount of business with Cambodia, then, then you would be captured. For, for what I've read as well, uh, the catalyst for this actually has been uh, a significant decrease in tax revenues globally uh, for a lot of governments. Um, and uh, outside of the big industrialized nations. Uh, and they're looking at, you know, as Jay was saying, Facebook, Google, they're, they're selling, pro, you know, they're selling ad services and other services inside these countries and they're not getting taxed. So I think that's possibly also been a, a, big, a big reason to push uh, for these changes. I, I, I would certainly agree with that. And I know from talking to some of other AmCham members, there seems to also be a push to encourage the Cambodian government to diversify their tax base. And I think this is actually one of those sorts of initiatives. So instead of just moving away from uh, 
regular income tax and audits. The capital gains tax has been delayed. This seems to be a, another tax that they've implemented to try to broaden their tax base. Maybe one more question? Yeah, so in terms of uh, registrations and certificates and all that, we do a lot of work with like transitioning like wholesalers and things to like internal digital commerce systems. So is this who wouldn't normally have to apply for these types of things? So is this regulation going to bring them into the fold as well if they are, you know, a traditional wholesaler that moves internally to a digital e-commerce? Or is this only more... Uh, B to C, you know, uh, public. I, I, think, I think my view would be to be more B to C. So I mean, if a company, uh, you know, if they simply digitize their internal processes, then to me that that doesn't sound like they would necessarily be captured. I guess my question would be, you know, do they have a website? Do they sell goods and services online? And maybe a little bit depends on you know how developed their website is, for sure. example. Uh, but let me also say this. I think. There's two things. Are your clients, are they domestic businesses? Uh, bo both. Okay. Both, yeah. Well, see, for the domestic businesses, I mean, from a tax standpoint, they already have to, like, collect and pay VAT. So I think for all the new tax regulations, it doesn't really affect uh, VAT registered businesses because they already have an obligation to, to, to charge VAT and to pay that to the government. So then the real question is just simply, where is the line for, like, these e-commerce licenses and certificates? Right. And again, you know, almost like all businesses, I mean, we're a legal service provider. We have a website. We email our work product to our clients. But do we do we need to have an e-commerce certificate? I, I don't think so because you know we don't you don't log into our website. You don't click buttons, and we don't sell you things online. But yes, of course, we have like an IT system, as I think pretty much like all companies do these days. You know, probably so many companies use Microsoft 365. Just because you use uh, online system doesn't necessarily mean that you're an e-commerce service provider. I think the fine line is like, are you selling goods and services online? Do you have like a web portal where you're selling your web, your goods and services? If the answer is yes, to me, you're getting into the sphere of you're an e-commerce service provider. If you simply have a website and you say, call so-and-so, and then you start an email correspondence and something gets sold, to me, that seems to be a different model. Sure. Thank you. Oh, is, is there one, one, one? Uh, yeah. uh, Let's say an insurance company sets up uh, uh, an online referral program, right? Or an online store as a rewards program for its customer engagement or something like that, right? So you technically, uh, f uh, you know, have that one area which uh, in, in your slides you had the list of areas which, uh, which are covered in this regulation, right? So would then the insurance company have to also take uh, an e-commerce license? Or uh, is I that think, a general exemption? I think there would be a greater likelihood that, that you would. And I think mm -hmm. one of the issues is you also have like banks and financial institutions, insurance companies. I think it could be tell. I mean, you have a lot of companies that I think are also getting into like non-traditional businesses mm. and people that are starting like platforms. People, as you said, companies that want to promote like user engagement. Mm. So instead of doing their core business, they're making available to their to their customer base lots of other like goods and services. So I think the more that you're offering like a platform, you start to look more and more like an intermediary. Mm. And intermediaries were like specifically licensed. Also online platforms were also generally licensed as well. Mm. So I would say, potentially, it sounds like you could go from an era where you, you didn't require the certificate to requiring the certificate. Mm. Uh, I'm from uh, Chandra Insurance. Yeah, uh, Etika uh, Chandra Insurance. Uh, we did uh, obtain a uh, license for uh, launching uh, our two products for fire home insurance and uh, personal accident insurance. And based on the law that you just uh, presented, of course, uh, insurance is exempted. But when we uh, ask for permit from our insurance regulator, they advise us to get the license from uh, Ministry of Telecommunication. So we did when they apply and they did release us the uh, uh, what it call uh, online uh, certificate. Yeah. And then uh, our insurance regulator did grant us the digital sale uh, business. That that what the experience I would like to share here. However, uh, currently we, we do have a uh, online uh, certificate, but we we also uh, have the gray area. We don't know how to submit our uh, business transaction or financial report to the Ministry of Telecommunication. 
This is the gray area that on the implementation side. Very interesting. And I think, you know, uh, now we're sending some of the exemptions in the law. And let me just ask one question. Did you get the, you got the license from the, the certificate from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. Did you have to get the, the certificate from the Ministry of Commerce? Uh, or the license from the Ministry of Commerce? No. So, so that's sort of interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's also, you know, there's two regulations. There's a certificate from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication. And then there's a license from the Ministry of Commerce. Yeah, because it, uh, it claimed that uh, insurance is under the uh, authority of Ministry of Economic and Finance before and now it's the non-banking, uh, uh, non-financial uh, authority. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that's also really interesting. I think that just shows, like, I think for any industry, uh, it's always great to talk to your regulator to ask what they, what they specifically require. I will say, I think the exemption that I talked about for insurance companies was under the, the e-commerce law for insurance. So that actually goes for like the MOC license scheme. But then if the MPTC has their own separate regulation for that MPT certificate, which sounds like that's the one that you had to have. So I just think it's interesting that you know, your regulator says you need the MPTC certificate, but not the license from the Ministry of Commerce, which is, I guess, consistent with the law at least, uh, to say that there's at least some exemption on, on one of those licenses. Sure. But so, I think, yeah, the, the takeaway is always talk to your regulator because they might impose their own yeah. requirements and they might have their own understanding of the law. Yeah. Currently, we only uh, encounter the issues of uh, implementation because we are required to submit the monthly uh, report to uh, Ministry of uh, MPTC. And uh, uh, also, uh, we also uh, uh, encounter the challenge with the uh, digital partner. Uh, whether like which form of tech that they need to pay and which form of model that they need to register. That, that all the challenge that we're facing right now. Yeah, I think there'll certainly be some growing pains. And I think it's like as these regulations get rolled out, one is when more people start complying and actually registering. And then as they get rolled out, I think there'll be some growing pains initially in terms of, you know, who is responsible to make these payments? How does that actually work? And just to see that get off, get off the ground. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. How onerous is the registration process for offshore people to register for VAT here? Like, for example, if Amazon wanted to register, are they going to have to send the and get Jeff Bezos to come and have his photo taken at the GDT and all this kind of stuff? I mean, is, is, it an, is it an easy process or do yeah. you know? I, I think that's something I need a little bit more insight on, to, yeah, be, to be honest, in terms of like how easy of a process it is. I agree. I think. Uh, it might be difficult to get Jeff Bezos to come and like register the, the, the GDT. I mean, presumably because they're an offshore business, they wouldn't have to physically come. But then again, uh, I think I need to look into that a little bit more. That's a, that's a great question. I, I didn't talk about it, but you know, there was a National Internet Gateway Law that came into effect, um, which requires like uh, gateway operators. You have like domestic gateway operators and international gateway operators. You know, under that National Internet Gateway Law, it does talk about one of the purposes that enhance revenue collection. So you could sort of see a framework being set up where, you know, under the sub decree 65, there's an obligation for offshore companies to, to register and pay tax. If they don't do that, there might be opportunities under the National Internet Gateway Law to like block their connections to Cambodia. So uh, you kind of see the framework being set up, again, where the Cambodian government could say, look, here's a legal obligation. You need to register. If you don't register, well, there actually are mechanisms under other laws to perhaps like, you know, pinch off your connections to Cambodia. It does seem because the Cambodian government has like delayed the implementation a couple of times that they have been, you know, at least I think they're aware of like some of these issues and they seem to be trying to encourage compliance. But, uh, but I agree, I think if you really want to take it seriously and really get a lot of people to register, make it easy, and then, then at least I think a lot of the really big, most compliant companies will do it. Well, I think uh, we want to let Jay okay. have, have his salad. <laughs> well, if anybody has any questions afterwards, please let me know. So thank you so much, Jay. Thanks, uh, Amcham, uh, and, uh, for organizing this and everyone for attending. Um, as you can see, there's actually quite a lot of issues. This is a, a space that is rapidly changing. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity. And what we want to do with uh, our uh, ICT committee and our connections to the royal government is to advocate to get more clarity so that we can all do business and be more successful here in Cambodia. So thanks so much for coming. And uh, enjoy the lunch.